Hi, welcome back to the channel. I'm Michelle and today I want to share with you the homeschool co-op resources I use to help run my co-op. If you're new here, I have a video. Go ahead and watch that first about why I started a homeschool co-op, how I went about doing it, some of the tips I use for it. But this video specifically is about the resources I use and how I plan the activities. So our co-op is a collaboration of a bunch of different parents coming together and we decide what activities we want to do. We meet once a week, usually on a Friday, and we do a specific planned activity. Now, our schedule usually goes one Friday, will, so there's usually four Fridays in a month, sometimes five. One Friday will be poetry tea time, two Fridays of the month will be nature study, and then the fourth one is kind of one we decide as a group of what we want to do. The first semester we will be doing, or the first quarter we'll be doing digital photography. That was what was decided on. So I'm going to share all the resources I have for each of those. So first up will be poetry. I think poetry tea time is a very good activity to do with a homeschool co-op. I think it goes for a variety of ages. You don't have to worry about certain people being offended by certain things. Poetry, I mean, I guess that could be depending on the poetry you're reading, but poetry is usually a more neutral area for people to come to. So I have a bunch of poetry books. You can get a bunch of poetry books from the library as well. I'm gonna share some of my favorites and some of my kids' favorites. Now, some of the books we use are, obviously I do like specific themed ones. So fall themed, October you'll get Halloween, pumpkins, things like that. Those are always fun to bring into the mix. Kids always enjoy that. This one I enjoy, Beauty E and the Beast. I think poems about animals and ones that have good illustrations are really good for the younger ones, especially if you have pre-readers in your group, they can choose their poem based on your picture. But a lot of times we'll just pick out a poem and have an activity to go with that, or the kids will pick a poem and share it. I also enjoy bringing in, you know, lots of different perspectives and voices into our poetry. This is, I think, a pretty common one. My oldest is obsessed with horses, so I got this at a library book sale for a quarter, and that's an awesome place to find poetry books to just add to your collection. I don't think you need to go out and buy $50 poetry books when you can get them so cheaply in other places, thrift stores, library book sales, garage sales. I also think having specific poets on your um, shelf is helpful. So this is a Langston Hughes. So Obviously having a variety of poetry in your house that's accessible, even if that just means going to the library and checking out different poetry books, these are my kids' favorite, especially for the younger ones. They really enjoy the pictures and it helps them choose a poem sometimes. Because again, if you're a pre-reader, we use this with my daughter for Lightning Literature Grade 3. And I think it's an awesome book. Again, I got it at a thrift store. None of these books were new but it has a variety of poems and it goes over a lot of, um, you can see a lot of different techniques throughout the poems, which is nice. This is probably the most popular. And again, I believe this is through Torchlight. Torchlight is what recommends this one. And again, the graphics, kids always love this. The poems are really good. So someone always chooses this one when we do it. So those are my top poetry books that we use. So for teaching, so usually depending on who's teaching, because it can rotate depending on which parent wants to teach it, these are the resources I rely upon. So one to help you in teaching poetry, I think is the Usborne Write Your Own Poems. Again, just got this from the library, I don't own it, but I do like that it goes over different techniques of poetry. So what is poetry? It will give you different types of poetry, haikus, sonnets, everything you can want. I really like that each activity is just a simple, here's an example of it, try it. And this could be in itself. So I wanted to introduce rhyming. 
that could be an entire poetry tea time where we talk about rhyming. The kids look for a poem where in one of the books that rhymes. They create a poem that rhymes. So something that simple. My advice for a co-op is to keep it as simple as possible, especially when you have a wide range of ages. You don't want to overcomplicate it. So we'll just pick something, for example, sonnets, Shakespeare, wonderful option. You go over what a sonnet is, rhythm, rhyming. He, Shakespeare's work is a ex perfect example of that. And then you create one yourself. Or again, you could just pull a Shakespeare and read some of it to the kids. It doesn't have to be overly complicated, but that is a great resource if I'm looking for, if there's a specific technique I want to write about or I want to introduce to the kids, that's what I use. I think Scholastic has a ton of books. I know Evan Moore has a ton of books on poetry. This one, again, I picked up years ago for um, a thrift store. So what's really nice is it will give you, it's, this one is specifically by season, which is nice because Sometimes we do seasonal activities, but it will give you, you can see my kids already colored it, it will give you a very simple poem and then an activity to do with that poem, how to introduce it, how to talk about it, and then how they could create it. There's usually a little template for them to do it, but that's pretty much how all of them are structured. You get a poem, you get an activity to do with that poem, and to how to write a poem and some discussion. So again, just a little bit of hand holding through it. This is something we use through Torchlight as well and learn how to write letters, fairy tales, scary stories. But there is a poem section here, which I think is really nice. So it goes through the different techniques you can use to write a poem by introducing different tools. And I really like the illustrations and the examples here. So obviously rhyming is a big one. Rhythm, alliteration, which is a big one. So it's a simple introduction. So again, you can introduce these concepts and techniques to children and just explore it through actual poetry. Some other ones I will talk about is Shakespeare Week. I learned about this from a YouTube video. And I think it's a really good option. I will leave the link down below, but you can talk about Shakespearean sonnets. You can talk about shape poems, different things like that. So again, it's just a different resource. I think it's very easy to find notebooking pages online where you find a specific poet. You could do a poet study. You can learn about their life. We don't tend to do poet studies. We've done it a couple times, but usually how we do it, because it is a poetry tea time, we have some kind of activity so the kids will either learn a technique or we'll just talk about a specific season and read poems about that season and we'll have snacks with it and they can make their own poetry sometimes though if especially if they're a pre-reader or a younger child they can just paint what they envision instead of just writing something so again it works for multiple ages it's very easy snacks don't have to be complicated you don't need a fancy tablecloth with doilies and all that. You just need some snacks. You can buy them from Aldi, pick them up, <laughs> have some poetry books and sit down and just read poetry. So poetry is one I would highly recommend for nature study. We used two resources. Last year we used Exploring Nature with Children. And what I really like about this is it has an awesome Facebook group where I've said in previous videos, you can literally search any like Thing you want to know butterflies you search butterflies you'll get a bunch of posts of what people did for their butterfly study different resources people use so it's kind of like all the resources in one and you can type and search but exploring nature is very simple it breaks down it for the year it'll tell you what week you're studying what what's really nice about this is it will give you recommended books for that week so again if you're learning about ants you'll have a recommended book list for ants it will give you a specific art that you will have to look up yourself. It does not, the art's not included in there. So we would just usually Google image something, an art piece that would relate to that and a poem that is usually related to that. Now we would often just take the book list, find a couple books from it. And I would often look at the Facebook group, see if there's any free printables or things that people have done. But it's really nice because again, you have that access and the Facebook free, you can just 
asked to join it, but it breaks it down easy for you if you want something that's very hand-holding. But on leaves, I'll talk about, you know, why leaves change. It'll give you a nature walk activity if you want to do that. It'll give you a book list. It'll give you a poem and some art for the week. And then it'll give you extension activities. So an activity. So for example, if you're doing leaves, leaf rubbing, things like that. So it really is a nice plethora of information. You can pick and choose what you want to do. This year, we will also be trying Magic Forest Academy. This is something I recently found online and I will do a screen so you guys can see what it looks because it is an online PDF download. So many curriculums are online PDF downloads now. Forest Academy website, as you can see here, and I just wanted to show you a quick overview of the curriculum offered. It's by season, as you can see, you can purchase the individual units or you can do it by season or you can do the entire year. It is, there is an option to buy it in print, but it's kind of pricey, so I just do it as a PDF download and read it from either my phone or my tablet. So for example, let's look at September. So for each month, you're given different themes. So if we're looking at, let's say Apple, you're giving the Apple theme for September, you get a suggested book, you get a suggested math activity, suggested, suggested science activities, an art or a craft, a recipe, and then a specific indigenous tribe to study for that week. Something else I want to show you that's pretty cool on the website besides just the nature cams is the free resources. So these are all free resources. You can look. So let's click on ants here. These are all different websites you can use. These are all different books suggested. These are movies or videos and then some games and toys, educational things. So this is an additional to what the curriculum offers of a free download. You can go through the website. So just like those categories I showed you before, it'll be on here. So you get a brief introduction. This is on insects. So you get a brief introduction on insects. You get a suggested reading, a math activity. So for this, you're doing cricket thermometer, using crickets to using a math equation to figure out what temperature it is. Your science activity could be building an insect hotel. Your art and craft is making these amber insect necklaces. Some different fun games to do. A recipe that could go along with it. And additional activities. Alright, next is photography. And we have a wide age range. Like my, The youngest in our group is two, which would be probably my son. The oldest is probably 15 or 16. So we have a large age group that they are possible to learn from. So I took digital and film photography in high school and college, so I have a lot of background knowledge in it. I have a lot more detailed knowledge, especially with digital editing and things like that as well. But again, that's over the heads of a lot of our kids. So I wanted to start something very simple, very easy for all ages to do. So I picked this book up. I saw this on the Mama Librarian. If you don't watch her channel, watch it. She has so many great resources. This is a guide to photography by National Geographic Kids. Now, my father-in-law actually teaches both film and digital photography in high school. He's a high school teacher. And I picked his brain on how to approach different age groups and things like this. And he really enjoys this resource and he actually picked it up for his school as well. But I really like that it's broken down very simply. It goes into the basics of photography. And then pretty much tips, how to get a good shot, composition. And what I really like is throughout, it gives you little mini assignments. So it'll talk about a specific thing. So if you're talking about portraits, it will give you how to set up a good portrait, tips for doing that, and then you go out and do it. What I really like throughout here is it gives different activities you can do throughout. So this is a pixel, you're talking about pixels and cameras and you get to make a little activity there. So if I was doing this for a group, I would just obviously copy that. But what I really like is they have different examples of what is wrong with the picture. So what went wrong in this picture? You kind of troubleshoot why it turned out like this, why you can't see the face. So those are sprinkled throughout, which I really like because I think it's great to show kids 
great pictures, but I think showing them what went wrong in some pictures and to troubleshoot why that went wrong, why their picture didn't was blurry or why the light was shining in someone's face and how you could go about fixing those problems. So when you're making your, or when you're taking your pictures, you have a better idea of how to take a picture. Now there is a, if you're looking for older kids, I did come across a really good book. I believe it's a DK book, uh, Digital Photography, and it's a complete course. I'll link in the Amazon below. I have not used that one because again, that is definitely more technical and probably for the older crowd. And I want to start very simple because I don't know how much background the kids I'm working with will have. So how do I make photography age from two to 15? So how I'm doing is uh, the kids can use a digital camera. I will have one there for them to use while we are having our meetup. This is one I've had forever. Um, and it's got the manual settings. So you can, we're not gonna go into aperture and ISO and all that. Again, I think that'll be over their heads. But what I'm going to do is take this book and I broke it down to four main areas. Cause again, we're only doing this once a month per quarter. So four main areas, we're gonna focus on a specific area. So the first meetup will be about composition. We're gonna look at pictures and magazines and they're gonna pick out something that they're drawn to. We're gonna talk about why they're drawn to it. What makes that a good picture, an actual picture? So we'll talk about you know, landscape, architectural pictures, fashion pictures, cause we'll have a plethora of magazines there. And we'll just talk about what makes a good picture. And then the next class will specifically fo focus ironically on focusing and zooming, how to you know, not get blurry images. And the kids don't have to have a digital camera. They can have a phone. Most phones today have a lot of camera power behind them. For example, I'm filming on my phone right now. So another one could be landscaping, lighting, flash, different things. So for each, unit we'll be studying, whether it be focus or zoom or an action shot, we'll have examples of that. And what I will have, I made, is a basic photography checklist for them. When they're going to take a picture, these are the questions you should be asking yourself. You know, who's your subject? What's your distance from your subject? Where is your light source coming from? So just gentle reminders. And then after each lesson, or each time we meet, I'm going to give them an assignment. So I printed out a sheet and it's just a simple assignment. So I think the first one is take a portrait and I have tips on taking a portrait. So take a portrait of someone you love or someone you care about or your animal, whatever you want it to be, take a portrait using the techniques we talked about, about focus and the zoom and light. So that'll be their assignment and then they will send either me the pictures or they can bring their phone or their camera and show the group next week. And we can go over that and see everyone's example. And it'll happen again. So the next week we'll talk about uh, action shots. So they had to take an action shot. How do you take an action shot that's not blurry? We'll go through examples. We'll do some exploring with my camera. We'll walk around, take some pictures. They'll get their assignment sheet of what I want them to take a picture of, some examples of a good, version of that picture and again they'll submit it to me so I can show it on a slideshow or they can bring in their camera and we'll see it again but it's going I think we haven't had our first photography one yet it's coming in a couple weeks but I'm really excited I think this is an area that allows for artistic skill and basic knowledge of it really helps so I'm looking forward to the kids learning more about just how to take a good picture so those are our main things that we do during our co-op. We of course have seasonal things as well. For October, we go to a pumpkin patch as a group. November, we have a cooking class that we do together. December, we do gingerbread houses. So we do have themed activities as well that coincide with that, depending on what season it is. But that is the main resources I use, at least for this semester. If you have any questions, leave them down below. Now, thank you for watching.